Rebonjour à tous et à tous. Welcome back. Great to see you all here. I hope you're all filled up with new information and new ideas, and of course, lunch. I hope you're filled up with lunch. How was lunch? Est-ce que ça s'est bien passé? Okay, parfait. Bon, excellent. All right, so you're powered up for the uh, afternoon that we have ahead of us. Et nous avons un super après-midi devant nous. And uh, we're going to get started right away because we do have a very special guest who is joining us. And so to introduce our speaker, here once again is FCM President Joanne Vander Hayden. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a great morning and a wonderful lunch. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the FCM annual conference stage our second political keynote for the, of the weekend, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The first time Prime Minister Trudeau, yes, you can clap, that's okay. The first time Prime Minister Trudeau spoke at this event, it was 2013, about six weeks after he'd won the party leadership. He's been a steady presence at FCM's gatherings ever since, even joining us last year virtually. We have seen some delegates joining us virtually. Um, we do have some behind us somewhere. I can't see them, but I know they're here. Prime Minister, in addition to this absolutely engaged, wonderful live audience, we're thankful to have the Prime Minister with us today, and we look forward to hearing his perspective on how municipalities can help shape this country's recovery. FCM is pleased that the latest federal budget recognizes cities and towns as vital partners in tackling national concerns, including housing affordability. The Housing Accelerator Fund can help build towns and houses quicker, by providing flexible funding to municipalities to mo mobilize their unique responses to the housing crisis. And we are all unique. Big cities, small towns, and every place in between, we are unique. FCM also applauds the federal government's emissions reduction plan, which rightly acknowledges municipalities as keys to reaching Canada's 2030 emissions objectives. One third of Canada's economic recovery is driven by rural areas, where the rebound must begin. We know that key to this rebound will be additional investments in natural climate solutions, wildfire control, health care, and the Housing Accelerator Fund's dedication to smaller and rural towns, especially those growing quickly. When federal and local leaders work towards, together towards recovery, we can address these issues in a way that boosts our economy, strengthens communities, and improves lives across our country. Local leaders in this room, united as FCM, are ready and eager to continue this essential collaboration. After his remarks, the Prime Minister and I will discuss the best ways we can make that collaboration happen. So please give me a huge FCM welcome to the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau. Hello everyone. Bonjour à tous. Thank you for that applause. Um, I hope the conference is going well in Regina. Thank you, Mayor Masters, for hosting. Uh, I've been to many, many of these, so I know a lot of the conversations happen uh, outside of the big keynotes. Uh, uh, so I really wish I'd been there in person, but I can't make it. But I know in person we've had Minister LeBlanc and Minister Mendicino uh, this week. Uh, Earlier today, here in Ottawa, I attended a ceremony to mark the anniversary of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. I met with family members, survivors, members of the 2SLGBTQQIA plus community, elders, grandmothers. The federal government is moving forward on our contribution to the National Action Plan to end this tragedy, and I know there are people across your communities who are also working to confront this tragedy, so in this day, I'm uh, glad to be joining you uh, virtually for uh, this big moment. Joanne, uh, thank you for that introduction. It's uh, looking forward to talking with you again. Uh, you took on the role of President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities at an extremely difficult time, and you've done great work. And the Councillor Rudick, Anin, I know you'll be taking on this important role next. And our Coleman, 
Holder, Bevilacqua, and Watson. Thank you for all your hard work to serve Canadians, and I wish you all the next best, the best in your next steps. All of you here as mayors and municipal leaders have faced unprecedented difficulties and have worked to deliver for Canadians. Municipal governments provide so many of the direct services Canadians rely on, and I want to acknowledge everything you've done to stay strong through these past two years and keep your communities as safe as possible. You're helping to lead Canadians through the pandemic and to recover from the economic impacts of COVID-19. Now, you're all part of the work we're doing to ensure a strong recovery for everyone. As part of this work, one of the most important things we can do is build housing to meet the needs of Canadians. Housing affordability is a real and growing concern, especially for young Canadians. They're worried that they won't have the same opportunities as parents and grandparents to own a home and build their future. Au cours des deux dernières années, les coûts d'achat d'une maison ont atteint des niveaux de plus en plus inaccessibles pour un trop grand nombre de personnes. Le résultat, c'est que ça pousse les gens à s'éloigner de leur lieu de travail, du lieu où ils ont grandi et souvent du lieu où ils avaient rêvé de bâtir leur avenir. Just last week, I was in Vancouver and met Kate and Guardian. They have three kids and they rent their home. They have good jobs and work hard but still can't afford to buy a place of their own. In April, I met Ala and Ahmed in Hamilton. They told me that housing affordability is a constant topic of conversation. They want to buy their first home, but prices just keep going up. When it takes years and years to save for a down payment, the price tag for even a starter home tends to remain out of reach. Quand je suis allé à Laval en avril, J'ai rencontré Alex et Simon, pour qui ça a été très difficile de mettre assez d'argent de côté pour une mise de fonds, surtout avec la surenchère des dernières années. Cette journée-là, j'ai aussi eu l'occasion de parler de logement avec Stéphane, le maire de Laval, et je sais que c'est un sujet qui lui tient particulièrement à cœur. Now, tackling housing affordability is a complex problem, and there is no one silver bullet. As you well know, Anyone who's offering simplistic solutions is simply being unrealistic. Mayors know better than anyone that these things require an approach that is smart, deliberate, and multi-layered. And that's what our plan is. In Budget 2022, we laid out an ambitious, targeted, and long-term plan to address housing affordability for Canadians. It's built on three pillars. Helping Canadians save to buy a home with a $40,000 interest-free uh, first home buyer's account. Curbing speculation by cracking down on some of the predatory practices we know that are out there. And, something that we here must work on together, increasing supply.
that will deliver significant new supply over the coming years as Canada continues to grow and know that we'll be there to do it with you. Vous savez de quoi vos communautés ont besoin. Vous êtes les experts. On veut vous aider à éliminer les obstacles et à accélérer les processus qui vont permettre de débloquer l'offre pour que tous les, pour type, tous les types de logements, y compris les maisons pour premiers acheteurs, les logements locatifs abordables et les logements supervisés. Que ce soit une question de zonage ou de délivrance de permis, ou que vous cherchiez des moyens d'inciter les promoteurs à débuter des travaux, on veut être votre partenaire dans la construction de logements. As we build more homes, and while we help more Canadians become homeowners, we also have to do more to support vulnerable people. Because everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. That's why we've, we've topped up the Rapid Housing Initiative with another $1.5 billion in investments over this fiscal year and next. This program has already created over 10,000 new units, and this new funding is expected to quickly build 6,000 more new affordable housing units. As always, 25% of the funding from this program will guarantee to go towards women-focused housing projects. Le logement abordable peut être un enjeu crucial pour les femmes et les enfants qui fuient la violence familiale, un besoin qui, malheureusement, est devenu de plus en plus évident pendant les confinements. Depuis le lancement de la stratégie nationale pour le logement il y a cinq ans, notre gouvernement s'est assuré qu'un quart de tous les fonds investis dans le cadre de cette stratégie répondent aux besoins particuliers des femmes et des enfants. Et on a pris l'engagement de mettre fin à l'itinérance chronique. Dans le budget 2022, on s'est engagé à continuer de fournir un financement annuel doublé pour appuyer la stratégie vers un chez-soi, notre stratégie de lutte contre l'itinérance. Ces mesures vont offrir plus de certitude aux organisations communautaires locales qui font déjà un travail incroyable dans les villes et les villages. By supporting vulnerable Canadians, unlocking supply and addressing affordability, we will build stronger communities and stronger middle class. When we have dynamic communities, we have dynamic economies. We need teachers, skilled workers, and care workers to be able to live where they work. For small business owners to hire locals and serve their neighborhoods. For artists and diverse peoples to celebrate culture with new audiences. For family members of all generations to be able to afford to live close to one another. It's good for families, good for business, good for the labor market, and of course, good for Canada. Making housing more affordable is a priority, and so is making life more affordable. For instance, in less than a year, we reached agreements with all 13 provinces and territories to deliver $10 a day childcare for young families within a few years, with all families having fees reduced by about half by the end of this year. And to make sure your children have the best... Yeah, you can applaud that. Yeah, you can. Oh. And to make sure your children have the best facilities to learn and grow in, in the April budget, we introduced a new early learning and child care infrastructure fund, which will help build new, high-quality, affordable child care in communities across the country. Of course, building infrastructure is a big part of building better communities. From massive bridges to small community projects, our commitment to infrastructure investments and partnership has delivered concrete results for people across the country, and done so at a pace that just wasn't there before 2015. Since then, we've made historic investments in infrastructure, investing over $45 billion towards 11,000 projects from coast to coast to coast. We're working with provinces and territories to make sure they have plans to use all available funding to get your projects. And we're working with you to advance priority projects. 
Federal government, as always, is your partner in this. We want to help you build infrastructure that helps your communities grow in ways that are livable and sustainable. As part of this, we're looking at ways to incorporate infrastructure spending and strategies that help build what Canadians need. That includes looking at ways to leverage public transit investments to build more transit-friendly communities. This not only makes our communities more livable, it keeps our air clean and helps us fight climate change. I know we don't have to tell anyone here why that matters. En tant que maire, vous êtes les premiers témoins des effets des changements climatiques. Quand des tempêtes ravagent vos communautés, les services d'urgence locaux sont les premiers à intervenir. Quand des vagues de chaleur mettent en danger des personnes âgées et vulnérables, c'est vous qui mettez en place des stations de rafraîchissement. Ensemble, on doit s'assurer de bâtir un avenir sécuritaire et des communautés prêtes à faire face aux effets des changements climatiques. We've made investments in wildfire preparedness, in improving and completing flood maps, and over $2 billion towards climate mitigation projects to help your communities become more resilient, including in indigenous, small, and rural communities. But as the climate continues to change, we need a whole of society approach. Le mois dernier, on a lancé des consultations publiques pour la première stratégie nationale d'adaptation du Canada. Cette stratégie va servir de plan directeur pour les communautés et les économies locales. Pendant qu'on lutte contre les changements climatiques en déployant des efforts pour réduire la pollution, il faut aussi construire des logements qui résistent à des étés plus chauds, des infrastructures mieux adaptées aux inondations printanières. Vous avez déjà contribué à orienter nos travaux en matière d'adaptation. Je sais que vous continuerez tous de participer à ces consultations. Keeping people safe remains, of course, a top priority. Sadly, over the past years, we've seen a rise in gun violence in far too many of your communities. Too many parents have lost a child. Too many people have lost a loved one or a friend. This has to stop. That's why we're taking action. On Monday, we announced the most significant measures on gun violence in a generation. Our legislation would implement a national freeze on handgun ownership. That means it will no longer be possible to buy, sell, transport, or import handguns anywhere in Canada. Déjà, il y a deux ans, on a interdit plus de 1500 modèles d'armes d'assaut. C'est maintenant illégal au Canada de les acheter, de les vendre, de les utiliser n'importe où. On continue aussi notre travail pour renforcer les mesures à la frontière et on donne plus d'outils aux services policiers pour empêcher la contrebande d'armes. Ces mesures fonctionnent. En 2021, le nombre d'armes de contrebande saisies à la frontière a presque doublé par rapport à l'année précédente. Pour nous, pour vous, je le sais, c'est clair. Moins il y a d'armes à feu dans nos communautés, plus tout le monde est en sécurité. We need to work together and do everything we can to stop preventable deaths. And we know that opioid over overdoses are taking far too many people from us. Tragically, since the pandemic began, this crisis has only worsened. Addiction is a health issue, but too often it's treated like a criminal issue. We want people who use drugs to be able to get the support they need because getting help saves lives. A few days ago, on Tuesday, British Columbia was granted an exemption that allows for personal possession of small amounts of certain drugs. This will help people who use drugs get access to health and social services instead of ending up in the criminal justice system. I want to thank Mayor Kennedy Stewart for his leadership on this and 
As many of you know, these conversations are ongoing with other mayors, notably my friends, Mayor Amarjeet Sohi and Mayor John Tory, to move forward on this file elsewhere as well. We all know that science-based, community-based solutions are critically important if we're going to tackle this crisis head-on, but we need to make sure we're wrapping those services around these solutions we put forward. That's why we want to work with you and with the provinces and territories to make sure communities have these tools that help prevent overdoses and get people the support they need. That's how we get through this crisis. Mes amis, on a fait face à de nombreux défis difficiles au cours des dernières années. On a été capable de réaliser beaucoup de choses pour les Canadiens. C'est le moment de continuer à travailler ensemble. Let's build big projects that help us grow. Let's build housing that welcomes new Canadians, younger and older generations, vulnerable people, and more. Let's build safe, healthy, resilient and diverse communities for our children and grandchildren to grow up in. Let's make sure that together we keep building a Canada where everyone can thrive. Thank you, my dear friends. Merci pour nous. Thank you for those reflections, Mr. Prime Minister. We appreciate the commitment that you've expressed to work with municipalities, and everyone here knows there's lots of work to do together. So I want to just ask you a few questions, if I could, just to drill down a little deeper into some of those things that you were talking about. And the first one is housing. Housing is truly top of mind for everyone these days. And for many in our communities, as you know, there's a growing sense of frustration and even hopelessness as they look for a roof over their heads. Elected leaders across the country are united in tackling the housing crisis as a top priority and we're advancing concrete and tangible solutions. But every order of government has a role and real progress will, be, will require getting much better at working together and quickly. Budget 2022 recognized municipalities as an essential partner in solving this shared national challenge and included investments in new tools, as you just mentioned, like the Housing Accelerator Fund and proven programs like the Rapid Housing Initiative. My question is this, how will your government collaborate with municipalities as we work to ensure that everyone has a safe and affordable place to call home in every community? Thank you, Joanne. Um, yeah, I, I talked a lot about it in the speech, but one of the things that has always remained with me is something my, my friend and a strong municipal politician uh, uh, before coming to, uh, to our side of things, uh, Adam Vaughn, used to talk about is housing is not just a problem, it's also the solution. Uh, and understanding that so many of the challenges we're facing, whether it's around economic growth or inclusivity or vulnerable populations or, or you know, moving forward into a, a, a better future for the environment, relies uh, counting on uh, communities and counting on uh, solid housing solutions for people. And right now, as we come out of the pandemic, uh, that already highlighted uh, people staying home and taking a hard look at where they lived and wanting to, to live in perhaps better places or improve the places they live in. Housing was already a big topic uh, with inflation pressures happening, with the rising cost of living, with the market uh, you know, expanding and, and, and putting so much pressure on people over the past number of months. Um, we also have a sense of urgency uh, that is extremely clear. We need to make sure we're responding quickly but of course, housing isn't something usually you can respond very quickly to. Although, that's what we're trying to do. You know very well that the Rapid Housing Initiative that we put forward during the pandemic um, actually really uh, responded to some, some pressing needs in a really, really fast way. And we're expanding that because that showed how quickly the federal government and the, and the cities can work directly together. Of course, things work better when we can include the provinces, uh, and we're always happy to bring them in as a partner. But when you want to get things done quickly, streamlining as best we can was something we were able to do with the Rapid Housing Initiative. Similarly, on the Accelerator Fund, which we're working on designing with all of you to make sure that it responds to things, 
is going to be about unlocking that supply as quickly as possible, making sure that we're building uh, new places, restoring new places, uh, making sure we're thinking creatively about how to improve density, to open up uh, new places for young people, for new arrivals, because we know at the same time, Canada is facing a labor shortage. We need to be able to welcome in more and more new Canadians at the same time as that's going to put even more pressure on our housing systems. So working closely with you, because for all the resources Ottawa has, you're the experts on the ground. You know where there's possibilities. You know how to push, uh, push forward projects. Uh, you know where they can be built. Uh, and we want to try and help you get over some of the, the, the resistances and the barriers, whether they be other orders of government, whether it be NIMBYism in some of your communities. Uh, we know there are challenges to increasing density and getting things built, but if we stay focused on getting things built the right way, particularly for low-income and mixed-use families, mixed income families, uh, uh, mixed, uh, mixed income families uh, use, that's uh, what we've got to get to. Thank you so very much. We look forward to the new tools and keeping the conversation going and being innovative. So thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned this as well in your, in your uh, remarks. Municipalities are on the front lines of new weather extremes. From the recent devastating floods in, floods in Hay River, Northwest Territories, the Red River Valley, and to the cat catastrophe of the wildfires in Linton. And surrounding areas last year, events that threatened people's homes, their businesses, and their lives. Our communities are using all the tools that they have to adapt, but the scale of this challenge requires us to move with more ambition to make our communities more resilient against disasters, ahead of disasters. My question is this, what is your vision for investing in local climate resilient infrastructure, building on the, on the work of the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, and how can we work together with the federal government to support communities in reducing those climate-related risks? Great, great question. Unfortunately, it's one that's going to just keep coming back because uh, the way our climate is changing means extreme weather events are going to happen more and more often. Uh, more heat waves in some places, more cold snaps in others, uh, greater, greater precipitation, greater droughts, uh, forest fires, uh, real challenges that we know uh, have already you know, cost billions of dollars and too many lives across the country. For that, we all have to be in it together. Yes, there's lots we need to do to continue to fight against climate change to minimize those impacts. But, you know, disaster mitigation uh, and, and adaptation is going to be a key part of it. How we think about our planning for future years and how Obviously, municipalities can't be the only ones uh, trying to build for the future uh, because your resource base is limited. Partners uh, from the provincial and federal level need to be there. We also have to talk not just about adaptation and mitigation, we have to talk about recovery as well. Rebuilding after these storms, building back better after floods, uh, making sure that we're planning for uh, coming decades in which the climate will be different and worse than it was in past decades. That's going to require all of us to step up together, and the commitment I've made many times is the federal government will be there to help you rebuild, to help you build better, to help us plan for the kinds of resilient communities that Canadians are going to need for the coming decades. The infrastructures we build today will have to serve for 20, 30, 50, in some cases more years. We have to make sure we're doing it. Thoughtfully, we can't save pennies today or try and cut corners today uh, and uh, find ourselves 10 years from now uh, with uh, quadruple the costs. That foresight, that serious planning, that understanding of the situation we're in and how we all need to work together is at the heart of the relationship that we continue to build with all of you. Thank you very much for that. I have two more questions. So Canada's natural resources have long been vital to our national economy. Sectors like energy, mining, forestry, agriculture, they've helped create good jobs, driven prosperity, built communities, and support entire generations of families. Yet years of uncertainty in these sectors have people worried about their jobs, again, their livelihoods, and their future. FCM's Western Economic Solutions Task Force, West, which you're quite familiar with, highlighted how Western innovation and resourcefulness can protect and create jobs, 
drive national prosperity, and support Canada's transition to net zero emissions. My question is this. How will your government support communities and their residents through a place-based transition to net zero and, and ensure that regions that depend on the resource sector are a vital part of the conversation about our shared future? No, that, that's a, a great question, Joanne, and, it, and it's core for this government and for, for so many families and communities across the country. It is fashionable in certain circles uh, to make a contrast between the economy of the future, which is uh, knowledge-based, virtual, uh, you know, it, it, it reliant on science, technology, and innovation, and, and invention, uh, and make that a contrast with a natural resource economy uh, that you know was part of Canada's past but won't necessarily be part of the future. Well, that's totally wrong. The reality is innovation and knowledge built into our resource economy, which has always been the story. The innovations that uh, Canada has led with through its natural resources, whether it's in energy, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in mining or any other forestry or any other area, has always been a part of it. Because Canadians are thoughtful and innovative and inventive and practical and figuring out how to be ambitious for themselves, their community, their industry, and their family in the future. So we need to understand that we don't get to a net zero future without a thriving mining sector that is uh, building the critical mineral solution that Canada needs and indeed that the world needs as we're seeing geopolitics of Russia not being a source for critical minerals around the world anymore, China being increasingly uh, unreliable or concerning as a partner to rely on, uh, our friends around the world are looking to Canada to say, wow, you can provide high quality, reliable resources uh, that we know are going to be done in ways that are responsible for the environment, responsible for uh, the families that do the work, uh, but also there to provide for democracies and uh, the, 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 those who share values around the world. This is an opportunity for Canada to invest and move forward on critical minerals. On energy, it's the same thing. Uh, we know uh, that as the, our energy sector turns towards more and more use of renewables, more and more innovation in things like hydrogen, CCUS, uh, or, or you know, wind, or, or geothermal, or uh, small nuclear uh, modular reactors. These are things that will draw on the very best of the energy innovators that we've always had, who right now work in the oil and gas sector, but who have the skills uh, to be able to work in these new sectors as well. Uh, a pipeline that carries hydrogen uh, resembles, uh, in many ways, or an LNG plant uh, designed to work on natural gas also works for hydrogen. The, the people who build these things uh, will lead to good jobs uh, in communities right across the country because no matter how smart and educated and advanced we get in our knowledge economy, Canada remains Canada, an incredible country with extraordinary richness in its natural resources. Uh, people who will be there to help feed the world during this food crisis that Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, has created. We need to make sure that we are valuing the place-based work uh, that people are doing in communities across this country that contribute not just to the well-being of cities and, and, and Canadians who, who live in urban centers, but people around the world. And that story is one that we can be incredibly ambitious about and excited about. We just have to engage in a positive way. We know the world is changing. Yes, Canadians have always been there to adjust, to adapt, to innovate, to be ambitious about the future. And that's where I think there's a source of tremendous excitement that we can have about the future we're building for every community, wherever they are across the country. Thank you very much. And that leads into my last question on behalf of all of us here at FCM. From protecting frontline services to ensuring public safety to supporting vulnerable Canadians, intergovernmental partnerships are key to getting Canadians through the worst days of the pandemic. And we work together so well throughout the pandemic, every order of government. So thank you for that. 
And through our federal municipal partnership, we've continued to make real gains for our communities and their residents, from the new habit rousing opportunities to expanding broadband. I mean, we have to put broadband in here because we're still not there. Let's learn lessons from these successes. Building on our federal municipal partnership can help drive a truly strong and inclusive recovery and drive progress on our shared national challenges, because they are shared challenges. We've talked about housing, getting to net zero, we've talked about mental health, and a place-based recovery that includes every region of the country. So my question is this, what is your vision for the federal municipal relationship and how will you work with communities to turn good ideas into stronger economies and better lives for people? Um, I was trying to count. I, I think this is my ninth time at FCM uh, and giving a, a keynote speech. I think, therefore, it's the ninth time I've been asked, so how are you going to work with municipalities to advance the future of Canada? And part of the answer is, I keep coming back to engage and to answer this question. Obviously, every year it evolves. Uh, every year we face new challenges. But I think uh, every year I say the same thing. We can't build a strong Canada without working closely in partnership with municipalities. It is unbelievably important. You know, and there's, yeah, there's, there's so many directions I could take this question. The one, the one that I, I keep sort of smiling at is, if you want to stretch a dollar really far uh, in your communities, you go to uh, the local community uh, nonprofit organizations who manage to take minor donations and do so much good in the communities, uh, so much more than uh, often governmental organizations can do. But similarly, if you want to have the biggest impact in people's lives, I find that municipalities are such careful and responsible stewards of every single dollar they get because you have such a challenge on raising resources and so dependent on trying to fight for every dollar that comes into you from uh, provincial and federal levels uh, that you have to be incredibly creative and in general incredibly responsible and responsive to the needs of citizens. So for me, working directly with municipalities is one of the best ways to get things done. And I think uh, a lot of you, I mean, Honestly, FCM exists for a relationship between the federal government and municipalities. So because there's no one from the provinces in the room, we can sort of talk straight here for a second. Sometimes there are challenges uh, in working with the provinces to deliver things. And I know that you're always uh, saying, okay, can you just send money directly to us and we'll go for it. Whether it's the, you know, the $4 million or the gas tax transfer or uh, other things that I know you guys love. But don't forget, every time we do that, we let the provinces a little bit off the hook on that. If we're instead making sure that the provinces come in to match those dollars that the federal government is putting forward, you'll have twice as much money to be able to invest in the things your communities need, and you know you need them. It's a careful balance we have to do, and there are uh, lots of provinces and lots of examples in every single province where we work extremely well together. But we need to keep, keep putting the pressure on to make sure that everyone shows up at the table, that everyone understands that your success is Canada's success. From our biggest cities to our smallest communities, the work that you do in proximity to citizens, in delivering those better communities, safer communities, stronger communities for them, is the only way uh, to build a better Canada. So I look forward to continuing to work with you guys directly, but I also look forward to making sure we keep bringing the provinces and territories to the table to make sure they're part of the solution as well. It sometimes be a little more complicated, but ultimately it ends up in better results when we work together. Because as Joanne, as you pointed out, the work all orders of government did together through the depths of the pandemic uh, was one of the big things that differentiated it's us from uh, countries nearby uh, in our success in handling uh, the worst of the pandemic, but also in bouncing back stronger and faster than just about all our peer countries. These are the things we need to continue to do, and it happens when we work together, when we listen, when we collaborate, and mostly 
Why don't we stay focused on the fact that regardless of the order of government, we're all serving the same citizens. We all want the same things. A better Canada for everyone. That, my friends, is what we're going to keep building together. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, Premier Mister. Like never before, the past two years exposed and highlighted our most pressing national challenges. They also reminded us that when federal and municipal leaders work together, we can face these challenges more effectively. And I'm going to leave you with one line. Communication is paramount. Investment in municipalities is also paramount. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you all so much. Really wish I was able to be there with you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Hassle my ministers. They're there to be hassled by you. Uh, and uh, we'll make sure we all keep working together.